These are the ones I can see with. You see? I'm getting to rather an interesting part, actually. It's going to go now very quickly. Unfortunately, it will be over before I know where I am. His exterior and his personality is remote, removed, distant, rather chill, and his look is the same, rather cold. That's the first, that's the theme, and it goes on like that till it stops. If you see what I mean. His look is very, very pale, very, very pale sort of hair, very pale sort of eyes. And what comes out of him is the most gutsy bash and crash and bang you've ever heard in your life. And it doesn't go with his face. It doesn't go with his personality at all when you meet him. Of course, now he's sort of, um, he's a little tiny bit older than I am. So he's, um, he works on the old crusty act and uh, sort of eccentricity and eccentric old man of music. And uh, that's fine. He does it very well. The most important thing in my repertoire, so to speak, is the indie rubber. And without an indie rubber, I'm absolutely sunk. So I'm surrounded. One, one's there, one here, one on there. And I spend my life rubbing out what I've written. When I was much younger, I always composed without a piano. But everyone said, oh, that's a great mistake. You must hear what you're writing. I said, I do. But in the end, I started to use the piano. And as I can't really play the piano, it's rather boogered the whole thing up. If you really want to know. <laughs> if I was really a good composer, I should be able to do without a piano at all. But all the other composers I know who write without pianos, they write far too much. I, it's too much trouble to me to, uh, well, having tried it, it sounds awful. Let's listen to this. What do you want to do? Look at me. <laughs> March the 29th, 1902. And I don't know what my what time of day is so much. No use going into my horoscope. <laughs> but I think it was on a... Would it be Sunday morning? Could be. You could look that one up about 11, I think. I don't really know. 
My early upbringing was very Church of England. My mother was a singer, a contralto. Indeed, that's how she met my father, singing at recitals at Chalton Come Hardy. I always like Come Hardy myself. My family comes from Oldham in Lancashire, home of cotton mills, brass bands, and other things. I was the second of four children. My father was also a singer. He'd been one of the first students at the new Royal College of Music in Manchester, which was just 10 miles away. Later, he became a singing teacher. In fact, a choir master at the local church of St. John's in the parish of Werneth. He made me sing in the choir, which I must say I didn't like at all. If I sang a wrong note, he used to rap me on the knuckles with his ring, which hurt. We lived in Werneth Hall Road, halfway up the hill. You know, terraced houses with outside loos, that kind of thing. It was picturesque, <laughs> in a kind of way. I don't go to Oldham very much, as in Oldham. It's not my favourite part of the world. School was a nightmare. My older brother went to the grammar school, but my father couldn't afford to send both of us. So I was sent to the local school, the board school round the corner, which was very rough. The boys were separated from the girls by iron railings. What a pity. I remember one particular Eileen and Slight, she was called. <laughs> I wonder if she's about. It all seems so long ago. Indeed, it took me another 65 years before I got round myself to writing anything for those brass bands. A little sweet. In fact, based on some tunes I'd done for a Cochrane review. My father used to take the Daily Telegraph every Saturday at the musical page. And I remember him reading out that uh, there was to be a trial of voices for Christchurch Church Little Oxford. And they applied to let uh, Willie uh, have a trial, is he? And I know that they, I remember that my mother took him, and the train was late, uh, arriving at Oxford. And when uh, they got there, the uh, voice trial was over. But as they'd come so far, uh, Dr. Lee, who was the organist of the cathedral at the time, uh, decided to give Willie a hearing. In fact, we almost didn't go at all. 
When the moment of departure arrived, the ticket money had disappeared. My father had been to the pub the night before and had somehow lost the fare. We had to borrow the money from the local greengrocer. I'd never been on a train before, at least not for such a long train journey. And you can't imagine the excitement. I remember I was very sick. My mother really had to beg Dr. Strong, the Dean of Christchurch, to let me have a go. I cried, I think. Eventually, I had to do a few tests, which was all new to me. And then I sang what I'd prepared, a thing by Marcello, that's known as O Lord, Our Governor. Oh, I think, yes, O oh, My Governor, O Our Governor. O oh, Lord, Our Governor. <laughs> Luckily for me, they took me on, and I joined up as a probationer of Christchurch Cathedral Choir School. It was horrid. The problem was I had a broad Lancashire accent, and the other boys used to sit on my head until I spoke the same as they did, properly as they thought. November 1912. Dear Mother, we have had a very nice time the last fortnight. One Saturday we went to the Dean's to tea and he showed us the state room in which Charles V slept in. I did go down in class a fortnight yesterday. I was ninth. I was sixth last week and I am now fourth. Will you send me some jam for a tuck night as I have to use school jam or someone gives me some? I am going to close my letter here. With much love, Billy. I soon found I had no aptitude for musical instruments at all. I was quite good at sport, though. I ran the hundred yards and did well in football. But I could never organise my fingers properly. It was excruciating when they tried to make me learn the violin. That really was torture because it sounded not physically so difficult as but it sounded so awful. I don't know, on one of those cheap violins. Uh, I've been just as bad on a Strat, actually. <laughs> so I thought, well, the thing is, I must make myself interesting somehow. Otherwise, when my voice breaks, I'll be sent back to Oldham. What can I do to make myself interesting? Write music. So I did. my earliest surviving work, actually. Well, I thought, I'd better try my hand at something for the choir. So I did. I was about 15, I think.
apart from anything else, Oxford was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen, a whole new world. And because of my composing, I managed to stay on at the choir school even after my voice broke. None of this would have happened but for the Dean of Christchurch, Dr. Strong, who was very musical. My parents had no money to keep me there, and somehow Dr. Strong arranged to have my fees paid. Then, instead of being sent to a secondary school, I was made an undergraduate at the college. They said I was the youngest undergraduate since Henry VIII. I was determined never to go back to Oldham, if I could possibly help it. October 1916. Dear Mother, the weather has been awful this last week. The Dean has been saying something to me about the Royal College of Music. He says it is unpatriotic of England to let slip such a musical brain. With much love, Billy. <laughs> somewhat unpatriotic of me to have lived abroad for the last 30 years or so. But I've often been back to London with my wife to visit the old places and see old friends. In fact, the first time I'd ever gone to London was with a friend I had met in Oxford, Sir Cyril Sittwell. I think I was on the lookout to, to meet anybody talented at all. And I soon found out that he was supposed to be the most talented person there. Yeah, he had such a long time. You know, it's 60 years ago. It's terrifying, isn't it, 1920? I chiefly remember how very silent he was, partly out of nerves, I think. He was very inarticulate. I remember that, yes. <laughs> we used to often have luncheon together. There was a terrible food shortage just after the war, and the food was very most fearfully nasty. And we used to go to a very nasty restaurant, which I can remember the name of it. I can't. He was frightfully pale and very thin and looked very delicate, I think, really. He certainly gave the impression of not having had too much to eat. June the 29th, 1919. Dear Mother, I'm going to London on Wednesday to stay with the Sitwells. I shall be staying probably until the end of the month, as there will be a great deal to be seen at Covent Garden in the ballet. Sitwell and myself have arranged a terrific concert for the 13th. 
If it's a success, we ought to make about 20 pounds, but that's a mere detail. November the 17th. Yesterday, I saw the new ballet Parade. It was very marvellous. The music was by Eric Satie, a Frenchman. I'm going to meet Stravinsky next month, or perhaps before, so that will be too exciting for words. With much love, Billy. The Sitwells were a rum lot. The father was an eccentric baronet known as Ginger. Their mother had been in prison for debt, and there were three children. Apart from Sasha, who was extremely knowledgeable about everything, especially Baroque art, there was Osbert, his elder brother, who also wanted to be a writer, and their sister Edith, who was a poet. They were always full of ideas, some of them very strange. When we were young, we tried to teach people their manners. For instance, with my brother Osbert's first novel, he happens to have a most magnificent profile. And some persons, critic, I ask you, writing about the novel, said that he had the profile of a Hottentot. We quoted that. We also quoted, as far as I remember, something was said about me, that I was as ugly as modern poetry. It seems to me to have nothing to do with one's work at all. And we quoted those things not in order to, to get publicity, but in order to teach people their manners. We thought they might be ashamed. They weren't. I mean, we have, after all, found and helped a good many great artists in various arts. We really have, you know. Really, they took him away from Oxford, and I don't think Dean Strong liked it at all. And what did your parents think of that? I don't think they were very pleased, really, and uh, they, they sort of just didn't quite know uh, what to think when they heard it, it even. Uh, I mean, we'd never heard of the Sitwells before. We didn't know really who they were. In fact, I eventually left Oxford because I was sent down. I just couldn't pass those damned exams. But the question was, where was I going to be sent down to? I couldn't go back to Oldham. So I said to Sasha, what the hell am I going to do? And he said, why don't you come and stay with us in London? at least until you could find something more permanent. I stayed with them for almost 15 years. One evening, Edith read aloud some poems she'd written as a sort of technical exercise. Osbert said they'd go much better with music. I couldn't see what kind of music, but I took the poems up to the attic where I lived and started to work on them. Eventually, by January 1922, I'd done enough to make this little after-dinner entertainment called Facade for 20 or so invited guests. I remember they talked all the time. So there we were, four musicians and myself. And Edith recited, and Osbert sort of chipped in, because they had a curtain. He had the idea, you know how embarrassing recitations can be, of putting the whole thing behind the curtain. The problem was that Edith's voice couldn't be heard above the music, so she had to speak through a megaphone, through a hole in the curtain. Actually, it was called a sengaphone, after a man called Senga, who used it to project his voice above Wagner. And everybody was flabbergasted, you know. I was too, because I'd never heard any of my own music, really. <laughs> to Babylon, hobby horses foam, the dumb sky rhinoceros glum, watch the courses of the breakers rocking horses, and with glosses Lady Venus on the settee of the horsehair sea, well o Tennyson in Laurel's road to Gloria, free, in a borealic iceberg came Victoria, she knew Prince Albert's tour memorial, took the colours of the floral, and the borealic iceberg floating on the sea, you were risen Madam Venus, for whose sake from far came the fat and zebra emperor from Zanzibar, well like golden bouquets lay far Asia, Africa, Cathay, all laid before that shady lady by the fibroid char. <laughs> Stout as any water but came stood with 
Mr. Black has both a drinking the black tarred grapes blood plucked among the tartan leafage by the birdie with his griefage could not wither like a squirrel with a gold star nut. Queen Victoria sitting shocked upon the rocking horse of a wave said to the laureate, this minx of course is as sharp as any minx and blacker deeper than the drinks and quite as hot as any hot and tot without remorse. For the minx said she and the drinks you can see are hot as any hot and tot and not the goods for me. We had a mixed reception, I think this is it is. They thought I was off my head, she was off her head. But we persevered and decided to try a public performance at the Aeolian Hall, now at last gone, Bond Street. This time with six instruments, plus Edith and myself. Noel Card came, it caused quite a scandal. So we did it again at the Channel Galleries in the King's Road. The Uglyf came. I think the Sittles enjoyed, even encouraged the notoriety. But it was a very raucous performance, very crude, the whole thing. But the reception was horrible. Uh, to, you know, I was rather upset by the reception. I never thought that people behaved this way. They did behave. The problem was I couldn't earn my living. Everybody I knew in that circle either had money or they could do something, play the piano or the violin or sing or something. But I was a scrounger, and scrounge I did for quite a time. The citrals were also the sort of people who went abroad a lot. While I was still at Oxford, they said, why don't you come with us? No one in my family had ever been abroad before. South from Oldham to Oxford, then Oxford to London, and now south again to Italy. But it was an awful journey. It was raining all the way through France. And we were in a, you know, no sleepers in those days. There was just me, Sasha, and Osbert. We uh, got to the Modern, where it was pouring with rain. I thought, great God, you know, well, old them again. And we got into the train and got into a tunnel. And we came out into the most marvelous sun. finished up in the Malfi. Osbert and Sash had been there before with their father. A beautiful, beautiful place below the Bay of Naples. 
an old Roman town where the sun always seemed to shine and where the climate, even in the winter, suited me perfectly. There was this marvelous, very quiet hotel perched on the side of the cliff. It had been a monastery originally and all the old monk cells were now rooms in the hotel. The albergo cappuccino was called. And there we all worked in our cells. It was ideal. I had a piano, not that I could play it of course, and a room with a view. I think life for Willie must now and then have been rather difficult. He was made to feel that he occupied a rather secondary position in the household. I remember once some biscuits were knocked, uh, the biscuit box was knocked over. Willie was told, by, pick him up, pick him up, Willie, pick him up. I think it was all a bit strange for Willie, like being introduced into a cage at the zoo full of curious but friendly animals. And I think he just put his hands in his pockets and his cigarette in the corner of his mouth and uh, went his own way. <laughs> Back in London, the twenties were in full swing. I had a modest success with an overture I wrote called Portsmouth Point. I was paid nothing for it. It was a gay old life with the Citrals. They knew everybody who was anybody in those days, in music and high society. From Sir Thomas Beecham to the younger set, like my great pal, Constant Lambert, and the novelist Peter Quinnell. Sir, she fell deeply in love with a musical comedy actress, and he and Willie pursued her. Sir, she has a beautiful picture of himself looking across at this strange figure, like a sort of bird of paradise at a distant table. Willie volunteered to go and... Uh, Willie was pretty sort of knowledgeable in those matters, and he said, oh, we'll just go across and, and make friends with them and bring them across, you know, and we'd all have a drink. But uh, when was, uh, Sashi was horrified that I'd have anything such a direct approach. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have much pleasure in playing a selection of hillbilly favorites. I loved going to everything. I used to go quite a lot, for instance, to the old Lyceum Theatre. But because I was always so broke, I had to scrounge for five shillings for a night out on the town. I could never pay it back, of course. I found I rather liked high life, especially when various society friends used to bail me out the odd donation. Willie went to a party, and there he met a girl who, who's a very sort of disreputable Chelsea character of the pet. She was called Brenda Dean Paul. And eventually, last, she became a drug addict. And, but she was rather pretty, and she looked rather like a sort of Lily picture of uh, Nell Gwynn. So she was dancing with Willie, and she bit him. She bit his lower lip. Well, then Willie's lower lip... We had to swell up. <laughs> and he came back and said, what's the matter with you? I said, I was bitten by Brenda. <laughs> it was a mad, mad world. The theatre, ballet, music, even. Crazy. The arts were full of crazy experiments. The only trouble was that if you wanted to be a composer, life was very difficult. It didn't matter who you were, you starved really, unless you were very lucky. I made at most 50 pounds a year. The thing was in those days, nobody commissioned anybody for anything ever. All that happened was that someone said, would you like to write work for so-and-so? Because it would be a good idea if you did which is actually what Sir Thomas said to me. It'd be a rather good idea if you wrote something for 
Lionel Tertius. Tertius was then the leading viola player in the country. So eventually I wrote him a concerto and a lot of trouble it was too. And I sent it off to him and it came back by the next post. And I was very, very hurt and disappointed and miserable. I don't know how to do. Always work for nothing, you know. At short notice, the composer Hindemith, who was also a marvellous viola player, gave the first performance with me conducting. Although eventually Tertius himself did play it at Worcester in the Three Choirs Festival. It's when I met dear old Elder in the lavatory. And he didn't much care for the work Elder either. In fact, he was very rude about it. Not to me, but he bothered to other people about it. The way I murdered that poor unfortunate instrument. were all wrong, bars missing, God knows, God knows. But now, this is a no rehearsal of the concerts in those days at all. I mean, you've got the length of the piece practically in five minutes more allotted to them. And I think I did have actually two rehearsals, is it being a new work.
but the Viola Concerto put me on the map, so to speak. It wasn't until two years later, 1931, that I wrote my first really big piece, Belshazzar's Feast. had wanted a work which would have a broadcasting appeal, so it had to be on a subject that everyone would know about. I asked Osbert about this, and oh, yeah, of course, all the fields put out. And he came up with the idea of the writing on the wall, which everybody knew about. At least I thought they did. They didn't, you know. I didn't either. I thought they'd gone out to eat grass, actually. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, I got mixed up, you know. Sashi had by this time inherited a house in Northamptonshire called Western Hall. And behind the house, there were some old stables to which I was banished while I wrote this work for the BBC. But the thing that gave me most trouble was that damned writing on the wall. And he was being tormented by this and making this terrible row. And then he opened the Daily Express and saw writing on walls, not meaning meaning to kill your false interest. Amy Amy Semple McPherson, she was a hot gospeler. And he was not amused by that joke. He did make the most terrible deal on the piano, but he was quite all right across there, out of earshot. He still doesn't play the piano very well, does he? No. Merchandise was of gold and silver, of precious stones, of pearls, of fine linen, of purple, silk, and scarlet, of frankincense, wine, and oil. 
fine flour, wheat and beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, and the souls of men. was. I thought it was awful. Well, I thought it sounded pretty bloody, you know. But I suppose the BBC must have liked it, because when the old king, George V, died, they asked me to write a coronation march for the new king, George VI. But, I mean, I wondered if I could possibly do this. After Elgar, I had no original ideas about it at all. Then somebody said, you know that line in the play Henry V? There's a whole line of titles for Cornish marches. The Crown Imperial. And um, what is the next one? Auburn Scepter. And the Bed Majestical. That's for the next. Prince Charles. <laughs> through the time of Hitler and the Nazis. Two years later, war broke out, which was rather pity, because I'd just bought a house in Belgravia and it got bombed flat.
problem was, what could I usefully do? I tried driving an ambulance. I was taught to drive this very heavy vehicle. I had to double declutch to change gears and things. And after I'd run it into the ditch several times, they said, that perhaps you better not drive an ambulance. <laughs> So as I had written music for films before, I think the first had been in 1935 for a film called Escape Never, and the second the following year, As You Like It, starring Laurence Olivier. So as I had done these film scores, in 1942 I was put to work. In the end, I did over half a dozen, I think. Things like the film Went the Day Well, and of course, the first of the few, story of the man who designed the Spitfire. It was my job, really, to make myself useful. Of course, after the war, things could never be the same again, and my own life changed dramatically. I married and eventually settled in the Bay of Naples. It's a bit noisier now than it was then. But I suppose, looking back, the war had actually divided my life into two halves. And my first symphony, written in the early 30s, was the climax of my youth. At least it gave me the most trouble. I've written a choral piece, we've done very well. Symphony's the thing, right. Then I began to think a bit. I, I realized I'm a bit of more of a fool than I looked. So I mean, a bloody fool in fact. And there I had, it took me a long, long time to get the first bar down. <laughs> Everything seemed to have worked out well at last.
start work early and work all morning and work in the evening as well from about four to late. Now I don't do anything of the kind. I get up late, do as little work as possible. I work in the evening because I have nothing else to do. I suppose I could produce more, but I think I've written quite enough myself. In the old days, I used to tour about the place conducting my music, but I had to give that up when I passed 70. Still, now that I've settled on the island of Ischia, at least it's a nice place for friends to come and visit me. One such friend is the guitarist, Julian Bream. After the war, I had been sent to South America, to Buenos Aires to be exact, to take part in an international conference of the Performing Rights Society. I was looked after by the British Council, who organized a press conference, and one of the journalists came up and said, and what do you think of our Argentine women? And I nearly said, you see that girl over there? I'm going to marry her. Luckily, I didn't, because I had been asked to leave the country. <laughs> we had a dinner party that night, and she was there. And I did say to her, I don't think you realize, but you're going to marry me. And she said, don't be ridiculous, Dr. Walton. So um, I proposed her uh, every day for about three weeks. And it was always the same answer. Then I didn't. When I let lapse, I thought, and she rather worried her. So the next time I asked, she said, all right. South America. It's, he, then it seemed terribly natural, but when I look back now, I think, my goodness, what a courageous chap, because, you know, South America, it's very, I mean, far back, where we didn't have a war, and the women were very secluded, and we were very, uh, education was very old-fashioned, we weren't allowed out without chaperones, I had my first job, the whole family fell backwards in disgust at that, and Poor William, he didn't know he was going to, when he proposed and said, oh, I have to marry this girl, he was going to have to battle with a virgin, all that sort of nonsense. I must say, he went straight to the first bookshop and bought me a little book with very neat designs so I could get on with it. <laughs> but Mama had very definite ideas. The moment we got married in the civil, the civil wedding, she had my tonsils out because that would keep me out of trouble, she thought. We came to Ischia for the first time. It was, first of all, very difficult to get to the island because they didn't have these marvelous ships they have now. We had to get on top of a boat that brought cows. They weren't accustomed to seeing foreigners. There was no way of shopping for food. We had to have a little mango to Naples once a week for vegetables. 
And it was very, very uncomfortable because there was no heating and we had no money. We had five pounds to come away from England. And so that we spent the first six months, I always say luckily it was a honeymoon because it was so awful. It dripped rain through the roof. My embroidery was all ruined. There were terrible rats in the house and every time you tried to cook, one jumped out of the cooker and, and or out of the fridge. But William didn't want to live in an old cellar because he said it didn't have enough light and he needed light for his music room. And when we bought the land, we sat on those rocks and then we had another sort of heart attack because we thought it was so beautiful from up there because one has the view of the sea and the valley at your feet that we hoped was going to be the garden. So he said, on these rocks, we shall build a house. But of course, there was a hill on these rocks. So we had to first carve the hole for the house. It took months and months. So when Larry Olivier said, for God's sake, don't buy that place, it's a stone quarry, he was right. <laughs> because it took us seven years to begin afterwards to plant on these terraces. buy the plants here. When William went to Australia, he sent tree ferns over and then one had all these tropical plants. An awful, awful experience because the custom house would sit on them and we thought they were going to die. But now, after 10 years of taking care of these things, they suddenly have come up to, uh, let's say, uh, not maturity, but let's say to be youngsters. And they look lovely. We have great fun with the water garden. I think Having the papyrus grow so healthily is rather super. They're so delicate and yet so strong. One plants the lemon trees in the middle of the shrubs and the flowers, and then they are decoration because they grow so beautifully. And one can also eat the lemons when you go by. <laughs> it is nice. We also have plants from the Azores. We have New Zealand things from Australia, from South America, and from the south of Italy. This place, it is quite heavenly. It means a lot to us. William, who never thought when he was in Oldham that he would have a garden, <laughs> lemon trees on a lemon tree, uh, a drive to walk up and down, he now has this. William always says that his work is worse than having a baby because he starts, it lasts longer than nine months and it's much more painful. I can't read music. I offered to learn by correspondence. But of course, <laughs> William said that was the only reason he'd married me, because I didn't know anything about music, and one in the family was enough. I've written for Julian Bream a set of five bagatelles. Pretty good, I thought they were.
Exactly as you wrote it. I think mean, it is, but you got it better. Oh, that's very nice. Got it better. <laughs> always enjoyed writing for particular performance or particular occasions. Oddly enough, many of them American. But I suppose my closest partnership has been with Larry Olivier. I wrote film scores for his three famous Shakespearean films, Richard III, Hamlet, and of course, Henry V. I got the job through a chap with whom I'd worked at the BBC on a play about Christopher Columbus. Larry had actually been in that too. He now persuaded Larry to do Henry V, Dallas Bauer. Dallas came along with this idea and he said, of course, there's only one man to do the music. I said, who? And he said, William Walton. I said, oh, oh, is that right? He said, yes, of course. And I had um, heard just about Portsmouth Point and a couple of other things that had been recorded of Willie. And I uh, said, oh, if modern. Yes, oh, very good, yes, I think that would be splendid. Larry knew exactly what he liked and what he wanted. For instance, he'd say, now, this is a beautiful tune I thought of. Yes, lovely tune, but it's out of mice to sing, my boy. That's the unfortunate thing. Nobody believed in Henry V at all. And everybody thought it was a gross eccentricity and an act of idiocy for rank to really provide the ultimate money. However, we went on. Uh, the actors liked the idea. The actors I engaged, they liked it. The cameraman was uh, not very keen on it. The man who understood the film was the electrician. And it was very... Uh, it was very bad times for filmmaking in 1943, for instance. In order to get a horse that anybody could sit on, you had to go to Ireland. And uh, the only way you could get the horses was to bring the farmers along with it. And they were the riders, and they were the knights in the charge. We were always having financial crises and gardening as well. The great thing that the film was the charge of the light, no, not the light brigade, of the old, you know, charge at Agincourt, court rather. Agincourt was the thing. No nonsense about French. And I managed to do that rather well. <laughs>
that sort of energy um, is a twin of uh, sexual energy. I'm sorry if this is uh, going a little far overboard, but it, I believe it to be true. I think uh, a lot of one's energies match the sort of sexual energy. Um, I'm not talking about results in either case, but uh, I think it is um, very much the same thing, that exuberance, that spirit, that heart-quickening feeling belongs in the same area of human nature, I think. It's a lot more to do with love. It's a very strong, vibrant kind of love. It's not a soft kind of love at all. And William's music is, is the strong kind of love. violin concerto before the war. It was commissioned by the great American violinist, Yasha Heifetz. Most of it was written here at Ravello near Amalfi, at the Villa Cimbrone, where I spent a lot of time with a lady I love very dearly, Alice Wimborn. Ah, very beautiful. Very intelligent, very kind. Oh, I mean, she was full of all of the tunes the marvelous woman. She was a few years older than me, a grand hostess, very rich and very musical. We had a little room outside the main gate. Alice was very good at making me work and would get very cross if I mucked about. Wagner came here to do his... Uh, his name is Wagner, actually. Wagner. All right. <laughs> Did he come here to live and, and hey, work? Hey, hey, he came to work. work yes, you know, yeah. I think. He's not your favorite chap, is he? No, oh. but... He's not mine. But you always stop him from falling asleep when you take him to one of those endless operas. Only because He's I... rather cruelty to animals, I think. I should be allowed to sleep. Well, I allowed you to sleep. Then what I, I, I should go to sleep too. Oh. Women have always been very important to me, then as now. And I've been very lucky, really. <laughs> I'd met Alice through the Citrus, oddly enough. She had a house near Sashes at Weston, and we spent most of the war together there. Then, one day after the war, she fell ill, and the doctor there said she's got cancer. Well, we, she was being treated in London by a very eminent old German called Plesch. And he said there was nothing wrong with her at all. Typical. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, in those days, I suppose it wasn't easy to find out if you had lung cancer or whatever it was. She had it in the Bronx. And uh, it was a very painful illness for everybody concerned, you know. Slow. Well, fairly slow. Months, six weeks. We're all very, very sad apart. And you know, one forgets about it if one can. So long ago, in some ways, so long ago. One has the feeling always that people <clears throat> in England forget uh, that one exists, as you forget that William is alive. Or, uh, and then suddenly, uh, when the Queen, uh, as the household secretary, private secretary, wrote to William about the Order of Merit, uh, she was uh, going to offer it to him, and would he accept it? And uh, this letter was brought to the front door. Uh, and William opened it and he absolutely burst into tears. After all this time, the critics would have left me alone. Not a bit of it. 
not as good as he was, you know, that kind of thing. In 1954, I finished my opera, Troilus and Cresta, with a libretto by Christopher Hassel. I sweated blood over it. In fact, it nearly killed me. The first performance was at Covent Garden, conducted by Malcolm Sargent. Heifetz, who came to the rehearsals, said that Sargent didn't know the score. Even worse was when it was done at La Scala Opera House in Milan. It was quite unbelievable, really. And naturally, at the interval, there was a holy one to take a bow. And I was a scene with the boos and cheers and hisses and everything. <laughs> I, I wasn't really surprised. And I wanted to do, uh, if I'd had a whistle, I'd have whistled back, but I hadn't got a whistle. And the last act, when they finally had stopped whistling, and we thought, my God, the music has at last reached them. They're listening. This is marvelous. Yeah. She's it supposed to kill step. herself. She's supposed to kill herself at the very end. Mm -hmm. And they'd taken off the sword with which she had to kill herself, Troilus's sword. And she went rushing round the whole like stage a hen, like a hen looking for corn with her head tucked between her toes, looking for this sword. Instead of just killing herself with any old thing that, you know, her finger. <laughs> then somebody threw the sword in, clatter bang into the middle of the stage, more laughter, more whistling. Opera has never really recovered, at least not in Italy. It's a lost child, if you like. I tried another opera later, 10 years later, in the 60s, a one-act opera called The Bear. It was during that I really became very ill. By chance, one day in London, I happened to walk up a big flight of stairs with a friend of ours who was a doctor. She said, no, you've got something wrong. You can't walk upstairs and puff like that. You must go and see a heart specialist. So I did go now. He said, um, well, there's nothing wrong with your heart, but there is a slight shadow on this thing. I think you'd better have it looked at. So I did. I said, I soon, I know what that is, my own. It, it's cancer.
they took away most of one lung, but he survived. After that, Iskia was even more ideal, because the climate is so mild and he could be left alone to work and not to have to talk to anyone if he didn't want to. So now he is here, working like a maniac, throwing most of it away as he does, and then writing it again. It's very naughty, because now that paper costs all that amount of money, I feel like rescuing it all and rubbing it out again. I think for him it's a terrible penalty to write music. He's locked up in a, in a room. It's a nice room, but it's always the same room. With great pain and effort, and then when you think it's done, he starts again. All artists are the same. They are, have to be very self-centered to survive. And when they are struggling with an awful problem, like writing music, or I suppose a book, or painting, they, they will concentrate entirely on themselves and uh, cut off from what surrounds them in order to uh, concentrate and provide you know, their own sort of uh, atmosphere around themselves. So one has to be fairly independent. One can't rely on him to be amused. Still print this lovely paper. This is fun here. You can look at all these wonderful sheets hanging up. I know. Each sheet hung up by itself. It's wonderful. Each, each little, little sheet by hand. I know. I suppose they could still make music paper if one... If one asked them for enough I quantity. Yeah. I mean, it's no use my asking for a large quantity because I shan't write all that amount of music. younger days to go out to nightclubs. I thought they were ghastly. Noisy, horrid, smoky places, which is very odd because being much younger than William, it should have been me who wanted to go to the nightclubs. Not at all. William wanted La Dolce Vita. <laughs> William has a perfect knowledge that he is a special person. That since he was born, he was destined, let's say. I mean, everything that has happened to him, like going to Oxford, for instance, it had to happen. He was late, but they accepted him. Something induced him to write music. He found he could write it. And I think, that when you are given this enormous talent, and this is your destiny, you feel a terrible obligation. So it's a sad life, because there is always this terrible agony. And so I found I had a job to do. Apart from the pleasure of doing it, I mean it is my job. I was produced, evidently, to take care of William. Gaga. 
I didn't like it. And does anybody, I didn't suppose they do. I didn't see how anyone can. And now, what do you look forward to? Oh, I don't know. I suppose death, I know. Thank you. 